Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Redeemer Presbyterian Church. Uh, my name is Robert Arendale, and I have the joy of serving as pastor of this local congregation where uh, Roger and Diane have worshiped with us and are members here for the last uh, year or so. And on behalf of the McMurrin family, I want to, to welcome all of you uh, to this memorial service, this celebration of the life of a dear brother in Christ who is now uh, worshiping his Savior face to face in glory. I know there's many uh, family here, uh, friends, uh, extended uh, friends, friends from many years and even decades ago, and so a welcome from the family and also a welcome from uh, this church. We are thankful uh, to have you here as we reflect on a man who loved the Lord and who served him his whole life. But we're here even more than that to reflect on and to worship his Savior, uh, who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, just a couple of uh, few logistical uh, announcements, uh, just some items during the service and, and following the service. Uh, following the service, uh, you were all invited, and we would love to, to have you all join us for a time uh, of refreshment in the Upper Fellowship Hall, which is right through those side doors, right there, and just keep walking straight, and right over there, there's a, a large, um, very spacious fellowship hall where you'll have a chance to, to greet uh, the family and to enjoy some, some food and snacks and fellowship as well. So that'll be uh, following the service. During the service, um, as two elements of the service, there'll be two hymns uh, that we'll, we'll, we will be watching on the screen from the Kiev um, Symphony Chorus and Orchestra, and you are invited to, to join in. Uh, we're not simply to sit back and just watch, but we are to, to watch, but we are to, to join in and worship um, with, with uh, the saints on the screen. And uh, the first hymn will be Amazing Grace, which is hymn number 460 in the red hymnal. And then the, the final hymn towards the end will be when the saints uh, go marching in. And then after, finally, the last, uh, just a reminder, after the service, after the closing prayer, I will come down and escort the family into the Upper Fellowship Hall, and then following uh, the family's um, exit, you will be, you'll be dismissed. So we'll close in prayer, lead the family to the Fellowship Hall, and then you'll be dismissed and make your way uh, so you can greet them and, and grab some cookies and refreshment. But this morning, we're here to worship. Uh, we're here to, to worship the Savior who lives and died and rose from the grave, who said, because I live, you will live also. Let's take a few moments and quiet our hearts and prepare uh, to worship this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are the one true and living God. You are the God who said, let there be light, and there was light. You are the God who is enthroned in heaven in glory, who created and who sustained this universe. And Father, you are the God who, who came down low in the person of your Son to save and to redeem a people for yourself. And Father, you have called your people unto yourself, out of darkness, into your marvelous light, that we might be a people who worship you. Father, I ask that you would be with us in this hour as we reflect on the life of Roger McMurrin. May we, even more than that, reflect on his Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, would you be with us in a special way? Would we know the comforting, sweet presence of your Spirit? Would we see more of Jesus, the great shepherd of his sheep, who laid down his life for us? Father, we ask that you would help us, that our hearts would be lifted high, in fact, that we would join our brother who is with the church triumphant, that we would join him in worshiping you this hour. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this morning by reading a selection of scriptures. I want to read... Uh, first, uh, two selections from the Psalms. So Psalm 23. This is God's word written for you and for me this morning. 
Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 27, verses 1 through 5. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble, He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And one final selection from the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, excuse me. For For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Amen. Let us sing uh, praises to this uh, Savior who has purchased a people for himself. If you're turning your red Trinity hymnals, if you look look in the chair back or the pew in front of you, there should be a red hymnal nearby. And if you would turn to page, to him rather, 207, hymn 207, Good Christian Men Rejoice. Let's please stand and sing. Let's stand and sing together, hymn 207.
seated. One of the glorious truths of belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ is that we have been adopted into his family. Behold, what manner of love the Father has showered upon us that we would be called children of God, and so you are. One of the great blessings of being an adopted child of God is that we have the joy and the freedom to to enter into the very throne room of God, to, to, to come before the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So let's go low together before that throne of grace. Would you join me for a time of prayer? Let's pray together. Almighty and gracious God, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father who reigns in heaven above, who is holy, 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 you alone are our refuge and strength, our very present help in times of trouble. Father, would you lead us to put our trust entirely in you? Would we give our hearts unreservedly unto you? For we come to you this morning in the name and only through the finished work of your only begotten and well-beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, our Savior, who was born, who lived a sinless life, who died for our sins, who gave himself for us, and yet the grave could not hold him. He rose victoriously and triumphantly. O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? Father, we pray, we plead with you through the precious blood of your Son that we would know, that each individual here would know, that the family of Roger would know in a special way the peace and the pardon and the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. Father, may we know as well that we in Christ have a great sympathetic high priest who sympathizes with his precious sheep. And thus we may boldly come before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find that grace that helps us in our time of need. Father, we thank you for the precious and sweet promises of your word. We give you praise and honor for the gospel and the good news of Jesus. We acknowledge your sovereign will, your majesty, your glory, and your wonderful, lowly, infinite compassion. That you are a father who pities his children and did not leave us helpless and hopeless in our sin, but came down low in the person of your son. Father, we ask that you this morning would be pleased to look upon our sorrow and our grief for the sake of your dear Son, and that we would know the consoling, comforting, assuring presence of your Spirit. Father, we ask that you would enable us to hear your word. Speak, O Lord, for your servants listen, so that through the patience and the comfort of your scriptures we may have hope. Grant us, O Lord, that we may hold fast our confidence in your forgiving mercy and the blessed of assurance, the blessed assurance that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And gracious Father, we ask these blessings of you through him who bore our sin in his own body on the tree, who rose from the dead, and who is exalted at your right hand, even Jesus Christ our Lord. And Father, would you hear us now? as we join together praying the prayer that you taught us in your word, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue together this morning. Would you turn back in your hymnals? And we will remain uh, seated for this hymn to hymn number 648. Hymn 648, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
come and invite the family for family. Good morning. I'm Mark McMurrin, the eldest son of Roger McMurrin. Before the family um, has some time to share some stories and reflections, um, we've asked Jennifer Kennedy, representing um, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, Dr. Kennedy Ann Kennedy, as the daughter um, of Dr. Inc D Dr. Kennedy, um, to come and share a few words about his time at Coral Ridge. Jennifer. Thank you, Mark, and good morning. As Mark mentioned, uh, I'm the daughter of Jim and Ann Kennedy, and my dad hired Roger back in 1972. And our music department was never the same after that day. If you knew Roger, he was just full of enthusiasm and big ideas. And that's what he brought to Coral Ridge. Both my mom and dad were musicians, and when they started the church in 1959, they wanted to have a strong music program. So when they hired Roger, obviously they got the right guy for the job. Shortly after he arrived, he had his first big idea, let's start a concert series. And my dad was all in, because my dad's main goal was to do anything he could to bring people into the church so that they could hear the gospel. Over time, our concert series became a big outreach for the church, and it was interesting. It showed that if a person came to the church for the first time to a concert, 25% of them returned to church for a Sunday service, and I can guarantee you they heard the good news there. The concert series was a terrific series. It had great artists like uh, the Suzuki Talent, to Talent Tour, the Vienna Bo uh, Children's Boys Choir, the Vienna Boys Choir, Johnny Cash, Glenn Campbell, the Oak Ridge Boys, and the list goes on and on. But that first year, they were bringing in 300 people to a concert. By the next year, they had over 1,600 people coming to the concert. I'm happy to report to you that we're celebrating our 51st season of the concert series. Last weekend, we did our Christmas Spectacular to a packed house of over 2,000 people each time, and they all heard the good news of Christmas. At one point, our concert series was the largest concert series hosted in a church in the country. But, you know, Roger had other big ideas, and another priority, obviously, was the chancel choir. And um, he, he also wanted to have some kind of musical ensemble in which every member of the congregation could serve the Lord in music. So the chancel choir was the backbone of the music department, but then he started a concert choir, and you could participate in that and just sing in the concerts. And um, then he went on to start the Choral Ambassadors, which was a high school choir. It was an outstanding choir. He took it and traveled all over, took them, took them to Europe numerous times. And then he also started the King's Choir, which was a boys' choir, along with the Singing Angels. Now, I can tell you all of these great things that Roger did, but let me say, he did not do them without the help of his wonderful wife, Diane. And you know, she got pulled in to every big idea. And I can remember every week going to children's choir under the direction of Mrs. McMurrin, and um, it was a wonderful experience. Well, Roger and my dad were obviously on the same page, and I can tell you why, because they subscribed to the same motto, excellence in all things and all things to God's glory. My dad, I don't know if he's watching TV or he experienced it live, but he saw a performance by an English handbell choir. Well, he went right to Roger. Roger, we got to have handbells in the church. And I, you know, I can hear him and you can hear the two of them going at it right now. Sure enough, Diane, oh honey, I'm sure he said, could you start the bell choirs? <laughs> so we had bell choirs for children, for adults, and I honestly don't remember any time in my life when I was not playing the bells. And I can tell you, I still enjoy playing the bells today, occasionally when they need me at church. Um, after all this was um, going on, Roger had another big idea. He started the Coral Ridge Junior Conservatory of Music. And growing up at Coral Ridge, I can tell you, was such a blessing 
And we had fabulous musical training through this. We were taught how to read music, um, to understand rhythm, basic vocal principles, stage presence, all of those things. And I am so grateful for that to this day. I still sing in the chancel choir and still enjoy playing the piano. At the time that Roger arrived, we had just moved into our new church building, a very large church, seated 2,500 folks, and it was the fastest growing Presbyterian church in the country at that time. So the sky was the limit for um, you know, developing outreach and expanding ministries. So with this beautiful new church, Roger had another big idea. And his idea was combined with our organist, Diane Bish. Um, she is a world-renowned organist, and uh, she's also organist emeritus for Coral Ridge. And nothing was going to stop them from getting a spectacular organ. So they put together a committee, and the committee was charged with finding a wonderful organ for our new church. And I can remember my mom saying how much she enjoyed serving on that committee and working with Roger and Diane. And uh, they finally decided on a Rufati organ from Italy. It is a 117 rank organ with 6,600 pipes with seven divisions. It's controlled by a five manual console in the chancel and a one manual console in the rear balcony for the carillon and antiphonal organ. There are four sets of horizontal trumpets highlighting the installation. There are three from the main organ and one from the gallery organ. It is absolutely a spectacularly beautiful instrument. Without Roger and Diane, not sure what kind of organ would be in that place, but it's beautiful and that big idea was a blessing from the Lord. And I'm happy to report to you that we are just about to complete a $1 million renovation of that gorgeous instrument. It will be complete next month. This has also been a wonderful outreach for our church. People come from all over the world to hear and to play that organ. I'm not sure there was ever a greater duo in church music leadership than Roger McMurrin and Diane Bish. So I know what you're thinking. There's another big idea around the corner. And you're absolutely right. It was called Church Music Explosion. Hundreds of musicians would come from all over the world to study under Roger and Diane. And then they expanded it to bring other famous conductors, composers, and organists all over the world for these folks to study under. It was wonderful, and they held it every January. My dad was really good at supporting and empowering people to grow in their profession. And he was also very unique in his support, total support for the music department, which I understand is not always the case in every church. So with this kind of environment, it's easy to launch big ideas and sure enough, two more came out of the music department under Roger. They started a television program called Gloria, and it was a, a music program that was narrated by Art Linkletter. And then Diane Bish started the Joy of Music, where she highlighted the Rafati organ and organs from all over the world. And that program still airs today. As you can see, after Roger came to Coral Ridge, it was never the same. He set the foundation for our music ministry that is still going strong today. Our music director, John Wilson, just in the last couple weeks said, and he said this to the choir, I want you all to know that without Roger McMurrin and the strong foundation that he laid here at Coral Ridge for this music department, it would not be what it is today. So I speak for all of Coral Ridge when I say, Thank you for Roger's impact and influence in the music program. Back to that motto, Roger did everything with excellence and he wanted to do everything for God's glory. Because of his faithfulness, the Lord blessed him tremendously. When he left Coral Ridge, he went on to even do bigger and greater things in Ukraine and the other churches that he served in. To honor Roger, I hope that all of us We'll do everything for God's glory. We will strive for excellence and that we will step out in faith like he did to do mighty things for the kingdom of God. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Wow. Um, Matt, there's a theme here of big ideas, right? <laughs> Which we're gonna be talking about. Um, I do want to thank each of you for being here today, <clears throat> especially for our, our family um, that has come into town, which I'm so grateful, and online, 
that's participating with us. Um, we have a responsibility of a great legacy from the McMurrins and Burris family that um, has instilled um, God's power in our in our lives, as well as um, an understanding of giving back. <clears throat> this may take me a little time. <clears throat> My father did not strive for success. <clears throat> he strived for faithfulness. He did not care about awards on the shelf, but rather making a difference in the lives of people. His success is in you that are here because he made a difference in your life. My father loved the music. It was not just his passion. It was like breathing for him, necessary for life. His musical career started in Xenia, right, right here around the corner teaching music at Xenia High School. And that's where he met my mom, as she was a senior in that high school and was his accompanist, for those who did not know. A few couple of years later, they started dating and then got married here in Xenia. And then, as you heard from Jennifer, the adventure began. We moved to Coral Ridge Victorian Church in Fort Lauderdale, working with Dr. D. James Kennedy and organist Diane Bish, and many, many friends. Three visionary leaders setting out to build one of the most admired church music programs in the United States. The church services would eventually be broadcast around the world demonstrating the excellence of grand church music and the powerful teaching of God's word. They established concert series, and I wanna give also credit to Carol Wilson who um, really ran with my father and being able to do an incredible series for the city. My father always had a new idea and loved to include as many people as possible to join into the joy of music. We moved to Highland Park Presbyterian Church in Dallas, Texas, and First Presbyterian Church in Orlando, Florida. My father brought the same energy and excellence to those music programs while making lifelong friendships. The, me the memories are too many to recount, and I'm sure some of you here today remember them well. My father at that time was at the top of his career in church music, and then 1992 happened, and it radically changed everything. My father was invited to come to Kiev, Ukraine. <clears throat> to perform some of the great sacred classics, including Handel's Messiah, which was forbidden during that time during the Soviet era. Those performances were, as one musician put it, an explosion of light. My parents fell in love with the people, their tremendous talents, and their desire to know more about God. A few months later, they knew for certain that God had called them to Ukraine, which I'll tell you, for me, was a very crazy idea. <laughs> My dad always had crazy ideas, but this one was the biggest. I'm going to go off script here for a minute. We had a jacket that had a world map on the back. And when he was invited to go to Ukraine, came home and said, where is Kiev? And we actually, thank you very much, we, we actually looked at the map on the jacket to figure out, okay, where exactly are we going? <laughs> so when he was moving, 
you know, the, the Soviet Union, you know, fell in 1991. He had the privilege of going there in 1992 um, and then moved there in 1993. Um, and they knew that they were calling them. And I remember my father saying to me, everything to this point in my life has been training for what God is about to do next. And what happened next was really radical because we had an estate sale of our house. I went to the car dealership, sold the two cars. People walked through our house, bought everything we owned. My parents paid off their debts. They had a few thousand dollars in their pocket and seven people that said, we're with you as funders in the very beginning. And they just left. The greatest lesson my father ever taught me <clears throat> was in this moment. If you truly surrender everything to God and go where he leads you, he will, use, he will use you in ways you cannot possibly imagine. And the impact of my father's life on tens of thousands of people is humbling. And a great privilege for my brother, my kids, my, my wife here to carry on that legacy. And grateful for the example that he's left me. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. So, so good to hear your words. Um, thank you all for being here, uh, those with us and those online. Uh, you know, my dad was a lot. Um, <laughs> I remember those early days, just picking up where you left off, Mark, of... Uh, you know, the first few months when we were in Ukraine, we were in that tiny apartment and uh, just beginning with those seven people that committed to, you know, helping us begin. And um, I remember um, we, there was a time mom was called away. Uh, there was something that she had to take care of. And for three weeks, I had to take care of dad. <laughs> He was a lot. <laughs> uh, I remember being so tired and waking up one morning, you know, I was trying to stay asleep. He was making so much noise. I was trying to, uh, you know, just stay in bed and not get up because I knew once the day started with him, it was going to be a lot. And um, he's in the bathtub. And he shouts from the bathtub, Matthew, grab a pen and paper. I have an idea. <laughs> we didn't coordinate this with Jennifer. Um, that's just who he was. And, uh, you know, from the beginning, um, we, the choir started with 35 people, and then it was 55 and then it was 80, and then it was over 100. And my mom, looking at the, you know, the budget, the, the figures, the numbers on paper, was like, Roger, you have got to stop bringing in more singers. Cause we, pay, you know, we paid them a dollar per rehearsal, uh, but even at that rate, it was like, you got to stop bringing in more singers. But then he sh told her, Diane, we, that's why we're here. And I need to take in more people. The thing is, he didn't need more voices. He needed more souls. And uh, he was so uh, choir rehearsal with him was always so much fun because he's it, 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 he was in his. 
it was what he did best. More so than concerts, maybe you saw him in concert. But boy, choir rehearsal was always just pure joy and pure connection. Uh, and it was his best Bible study was his choir rehearsals. He could certainly teach the Bible, but when he taught the Bible through music, um, it was uh, him just sharing a piece of himself. And so as the choir uh, grew um, and we began to have concerts, at the second concert he goes, we can't just have one concert when we didn't have any money. Uh, we were really just every single week we were figuring out how we're going to do what's next. And, uh, but yet, he said, the audience needs to know what's coming, so we're going to plan a concert series, and we're going to have eight concerts, and we're going to pass this out, and everyone's going to know, you know, this is what we're setting out to do, so that we can begin to build something. Of course, we didn't have the money for that. Um, in that mix, the very first Christmas, uh, he, uh, these people had never experienced uh, wonderful Christmas carols that we enjoy. Um, this music was banned. And he, uh, he, had, he said, we have to do a Christmas concert and we need to do it three times. And uh, it was a wonderful ministry opportunity for him because you know, we didn't have the money for it. So he went to the choir his choir full of, peop of skeptics, atheists, agnostics, and said, okay, we need to get in a circle and we need to pray uh, because we don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> and we got in a big circle and we prayed together that the Lord would provide. And that night, the fax machine started to make some noise and a a donor in the United States gave $5,000, which we had never received anything even close to that before. And uh, it covered the Christmas concerts. And the next rehearsal, he got to go back and say, God provided! And it was such a tremendous witness. Um, that Christmas, after we finished the Christmas concert, and when we were on the plane going back for our first trip back to America to tell our friends about what God was doing, we had $20 in our pocket. So we were living on what we referred to back then as manna. And, uh, but it was amazing. And yet, all the time, he had these um, crazy ideas. He would it would often start with him saying, one day, you know, one day, uh, we're going to have a, a place in the center of the city, and it's going to become a hub for... Uh, the musicians in the city of Kiev and there will be a library and they can come and borrow this great music that we've brought to share with them and uh, we're going to have Bible studies in the center of the city and grow this and everything that he was describing this was in the first year it all happened you know some years later now there were many big ideas that did not materialize but that to me is just as amazing because for every Every big idea that happened, there were a dozen that didn't happen, but that didn't discourage him. He, he just moved on to the next one. And uh, that's something that just impresses me about Dad. Um, so, it wasn't just that he had these big ideas for himself. It was never about himself. He had big ideas for other people. Um, it was with him that he inspired me to start the Kiev Youth Orchestra and Chorus and go down that road with that idea. He believed in people. And he had a way of making you believe that you could do it. Um, one of the craziest things you know, they started doing American tours, but one time they were doing, a, they, it, it, 
my brother was running the office back in the States, and he said to Mark, Mark, we're going to go to uh, the West Coast, and we're going to do a West Coast tour, which, was that the first West Coast tour? I, no, it wasn't the first one, the second one, okay, the second West Coast tour. The West Coast tour was ha much harder to accomplish because of the space between cities. And uh, we're also going to go to central Russia. We're going to go to Kazan and Yekaterinburg and all these other cities that maybe you haven't heard of, but all of them are over a million people. And we're going to take the gospel there and we're going to take the Messiah in the Russian language. And, uh, you know, the American tours, they largely, we, we, we learned through smart people like my brother how to make them pay for themselves. But this tour to central Russia, we could only do it. There was nothing that was going to come from central Russia to pay for that. It was all donors. And so my brother was like, Dad, this is impossible. How are we going to do both of these things? Well, it happened. He, uh, he never stopped working, but it was because of his love of people that he never stopped. You know, I'm sure that when he arrived, at the gates of heaven and met Jesus, that he wasn't ready for eternal rest. <laughs> I'm sure he was ready to get to work. And I imagine that Jesus said to him, Roger, grab a pen and paper. I have an idea. <laughs> I too want to thank you all for coming. And I want to greet all that are watching online uh, across the world, really and especially those who are watching in Kiev, Ukraine. To those Ukrainians, I want to tell you, I love you and I miss you. For my sharing, I'm not going to share my own words. That's going to be too hard. I want to share the words of a Ukrainian lady who was just a little girl at our at uh, the time that we moved to Ukraine. Her name is Dasha Donskaya Pipan. And when I received her tribute about Roger, I thought, this needs to be shared. She says, Our Roger McMurrin is with the Lord now. It's hard to say that out loud. And yet, we are comforted to know he is with his heavenly Father and will never again know pain or loss. I quietly processed this news all day, taking in what hundreds of Ukrainians and non-Ukrainians were saying. There were memories and words of gratitude flooding Facebook all day. Roger touched our hearts. He brought the gospel to us. He changed our lives. He helped develop choral music as art in Ukraine. He brought glory to God with music we had never heard before. He was our spiritual father. He was an American with a Ukrainian heart. He was a man of such strong faith. He showed us what it means to trust God. The Lord used him mightily to bring so many people to Christ. In the early 1990s, when almost none of Ukrainians owned a Bible, Roger came to Ukraine to perform Handel's Messiah. He gathered a group of ex exceptionally, exceptionally talented musicians 
He worked many hours to help them master the music. He also taught the words of Messiah as part of the rehearsal. There were so many questions from the choir members and orchestra members about the message of this music that Roger simply had to stay and try and answer as many as he could. Providentially, my father was a member of that choir. Roger and his wife Diane started a Bible study in their apartment in Varishniki in Kiev. Though not believers at that time, my parents attended too. They had many questions about the Bible, and this is how our church started. One of the most important moments in my very young and growing faith was the day my family was burying my grandmother. She was a teacher, so the funeral was at her school. She was very beloved by all, so the schoolyard was packed with family, friends, neighbors, teachers, students, all wearing black, lamenting and crying out loudly in devastation. The grief was all-consuming, and as an 11-year-old, I could barely handle the constantly flowing flood of anguish and hopelessness. And then Roger showed up. He came to support our family. My dad had shared with him that my grandmother had professed her faith in Christ a few days before she passed away in the hospital. So Roger had confidence that she was with the Lord. And he was truly surprised to see the utter devastation on our faces. Yes, her body is here. This is what you're mourning. But her soul is with the Lord, free from sufferings and pain. There's no need to cry. Jesus already wiped away all of her tears. Find comfort in that and rest. Roger said all those words with a big smile. The only one smiling at the funeral. <laughs> those words and that smile helped me to get through it and changed how I viewed Christian faith. And I do believe I will get to enjoy my grandma's company in eternity. And Roger will be there, smiling that big smile, saying, I told you so. <laughs> well done, good and faithful servant. You ran your race with endurance and completed it. Thank you. Now, if we'll all stand, we're going to have the privilege of being, um, of having the Kiev Symphony Orchestra and Chorus lead us in amazing grace, and the uh, words will be on the screen. Um, the, the choir is going to sing the first verse in English, and then the third, fourth, I mean the second, third, and sixth verse, which is the other three they'll be singing, will be in Ukrainian, but the subtitles will be up there so we can sing in English. If you have a hard time seeing the screen, you can, it's, it's in your hymnal in, at 460. Um, the Kiev Symphony Orchestra and Chorus is so special to us. They are our friends, and we're privileged and honored for them to lead us.
Please, please be seated. I'm going to read a couple verses from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 14, and then we'll read two verses from the Gospel of John in just a moment. But first, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Amen. We need to stop gazing at our navels and simply get out there and share the good news of Jesus. These were some of the last words that Roger uh, McMurrin shared with me just over a week ago. I think it captures the sentiment that we've been uh, hearing about this morning. And they capture the heart of a man who went home to be with his Lord last Wednesday morning around 7 a.m. Uh, Roger was quite the man, a uh, devoted husband, father, grandfather, musician, writer, evangelist, servant of the Lord. I, I had the joy and privilege of knowing Roger for only about a year or so. Uh, it was about a year or so that Roger and Diane uh, showed up through some mutual friends and have been worshiping with us and became members here at this church. But uh, I'm assuming we would all agree that if you knew Roger for a moment, it felt like you knew him for a lifetime. Mr. Roger McMurrin left a good testimony to his Lord, that of a faithful witness and servant. And yes, we are here this morning grieving. And we grieve the loss of a husband and a father, Diane and Matthew and Mark, the rest of the family. Uh, you have been and will continue to be in our prayers, and we pray that you would know the peace and comfort of the Lord Jesus who does all things well. We grieve the loss of a friend. And it's okay. It, it is okay to grieve. We see the psalmist grieving throughout the Psalter. Because to grieve is an acknowledgement that death is unnatural. That it's not the way the Lord intended things to be from the beginning. In fact, death is the last enemy. The Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember that first creation week back in Genesis chapter 1. In the span of six days, God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 1.31, the Lord surveys his creation and he says, He saw all that he had made and behold, it was good. It was very good. Then we come to the tragedy of Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve's rebellion against the Lord. They're listening to the voice of the serpent instead of the voice of God. The fall and grief, and hardship, and toil, and death stain creation. And since that fall in Genesis 3, creation itself has been longing in child pains for the redemption when Christ returns. But what does the Apostle Paul tell us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13? That Christians, believers, do not grieve as others do who have no hope. Rather, as believers, we do grieve, yes, and that is good and right to do. But we grieve with hope. We grieve with the hope of the gospel. The sure and certain hope that Jesus Christ has overcome the grave, that through his death, that through the cross, he destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Look at, back in 1 Thessalonians chapter Four, look at verse 14. The, the last phrase in verse 13 is, we do not grieve as others do who have no hope. Verse 14, for, no, this gives us the reason why we grieve with hope. Verse 14, for, since we believe that Jesus died 
and rose again. That is, our hope is founded upon the gospel of the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus, the second Adam. Now, during this time of year, we think in a special way of the incarnation. I've heard, and Roger told me, that he so loved the, the great Christmas hymns and carols that speak of the, the, the heavens being torn open and God himself storming into this sinful, fallen world. And during this time, we do think in a special way of the incarnation of the babe in the manger who was born to live and born to die and born to rise again. The manger leads us to the cross and the cross leads us to the empty tomb and the empty tomb leads us to the Mount of Olives from which Jesus ascended to the right hand of his Father. This is the hope that Roger had. This gospel hope. This is the hope that sustained our dear brother in the Lord, and even more so that we've been capturing and hearing a little bit about this morning. This is the hope and truth that animated Mr. Roger McMurrin. As I mentioned, we would all agree if you knew Roger for 10 minutes, you knew him for 10 years. Indeed, he was a brother in the Lord, full of life, full of energy, full of words, full of Full of ideas. The last Wednesday morning, I have the, the, the privilege of the day that the Roger went home. He went to his true home, uh, spending some time with Diane and, and Matthew and Mark, and hearing many of these stories. And it was a, a joyful time. It, it's what it's what it ought to be when a Christian goes home uh, to be with the Lord again. Yes, we grieve. Death is unnatural. It's the last enemy, but it's an enemy that has been overcome once and for all through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to reflect on, just just for a few minutes, just for a moment, on this hope, this gospel hope that sustained and animated our dear friend. And these are the words of Jesus in John chapter 11 that he spoke to his dear friend Martha. The occasion was, of course, the death of Martha's brother, uh, Lazarus, John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Martha is grieving of the death of her brother, and Jesus gives her these words, John eleven twenty five 25 and 26. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I think if Roger were here, he would want to ask each of us, do you, each of you, do you believe this? A couple of brief thoughts from, from these famous words. Note that Jesus begins with, I am the resurrection and the life. This is one of Jesus' famous I am statements where Jesus is boldly claiming to be Yahweh, Yahweh in the flesh. I am. Jesus is picking up on what the Lord said to Moses back in on, on, on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 3 when the Lord reveals to Moses that I am who I am. And here in the Gospels, Jesus, knowing exactly what he's doing, takes that exact title to himself. I am, Jesus says, I am Yahweh. I am God in the flesh. I am the creator and the sustainer of this universe come in the flesh in the person of the Son. I am the resurrection and the life. Life, true life, is found in Jesus himself. Not an abstract idea, not some fancy philosophy, but life is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus possesses the fullness of life in himself. And the life that is in view, the life that Jesus is talking about, is not mere continuing of existence in this world. It's not really much hope at all. But the life that Jesus has in view is eternal life. It is the fullness of life. It is resurrection life found in the resurrected one himself. Notice the order. The order is intentional. I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection first, then life. Because it is resurrection life that Jesus has in view. Eternal life lived in glory with the Lord. That life, 
is found in Jesus alone. It's what Jesus speaks of in John 10.10. I have come that you might have life, true life, not, not simply a continuing of our life in this world, but true life, eternal life, forever with God in glory. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Martha didn't understand. Martha was grieving the loss of her brother, and thus Jesus gives her this glorious reminder that true resurrection life is found in him and in him alone to encourage her and to sustain Jesus' beloved friend, Martha. Second thought. Jesus goes on, I am the resurrection and the life, and then he gives two phrases. Whoever believes in me, that is, whoever abides in me, whoever rests in me, whoever has entrusted and given themselves with a true and living, saving faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever believes in me, though he die, in the death that is in view is death in this world, yet, Jesus goes on, yet shall he live. Yet shall he come to life is, is the idea. Yet shall he live now forever in heaven. But even more than that, what Jesus has in view is yet shall he live in glory in the new heavens, in the new earth forever with our Savior. Roger believed in Christ. He gave the good confession, profession of faith. And yes, he died last week in this world, in this sinful fallen age, but he shall live. Now, right now, in heaven, was the Apostle Paul say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The very instant next breath after we, we die in this world, that next breath is breathed in heaven with the Lord himself. And in the final phrase, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And then the last phrase, and whoever lives, the idea of whoever lives by faith, whoever has been born from above, whoever is a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And it's emphasized in the original language, shall never, ever taste eternal death. Why? Because our Savior has tasted it for his people. Because Jesus tasted that death that we deserve in himself as our substitute on the cross. For the believer, for Roger, we can take the words of the Apostle Paul that to die is gain. For it is the entrance to eternal life in glory with our faithful Savior. And it is this hope and belief, this gospel fire that compelled uh, Roger and Diane with their family, we, we've already heard about it, to give up there. I think they would all agree, rather comfortable life here in the States to go to Ukraine and even around the world to share the name of the Lord Jesus. Brothers and sisters, our dear friend Roger McMurrin went home to be with his king just over a week ago. But he is more alive right now than he has ever been. No doubt he conducted some astounding concerts and choruses, but they all pale in comparison to the glorious angelic choir that he is participating in right now. Revelation chapters 4 and 5 gives us something of a sneak peek into heavenly worship that he is enjoying at this very moment, led, conducted by Jesus himself. Because Jesus has made the way. He has made that new and living way through his once and for all sinless life, death and resurrection, taking the wrath and judgment that we all deserve because of our sin. He has made the way and, and entered the, 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 the presence into God himself. And that is the joy that Roger knows, and that is the joy, and I can say this, that no doubt he would want each of us to know as well, to know the joy of the Lord that is found in Christ alone. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for Christ's 
once and for all, birth and life and death and resurrection. We thank you that you demonstrated your love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes, miserable sinners like all of us, he became poor, that through his poverty we might have true, glorious riches in Christ forever. May we all know that hope and comfort, the hope and comfort of Christ himself. pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us respond to this by singing together this glorious hymn. If you turn in your red hymnals to hymn 92, this wonderful hymn of the Reformation, hymn 92, a mighty fortress is our God. Let's please stand and sing together, hymn 92. Just a few final remarks and then we will 
uh, close our time by, again, uh, joining in with the Kiev Symphony Orchestra and Chorus as they lead us in when the saints uh, go marching in. But some of, again, the last words that Roger uh, shared with me spoke about the all-satisfying grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, no doubt, would want each of us to know and be challenged with that truth that this world offers us so many things, but, dear friends, none of them satisfy the longing of our hearts. As the psalmist said, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none on earth that I desire besides you. Though my flesh and my heart may feel, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. At your right hand, Psalm 1611, are treasures forevermore. Because at the right hand of the Father is the one who is the true treasure and the pearl of greatest price, the Lord Jesus Christ. So may we all go from this place this afternoon and seek to be faithful, humble servants, ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, walking not by sight, not by the things in this world, but walking by faith. Faith in our Savior who lived and died and rose again. Amen. Let's join the Kiev Symphony Orchestra and Chorus as this uh, final hymn, When the Saints Come Marching In. And let's, let's, let's stand and, and join them.
Let's pray together. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy of the gospel. We thank you for the gift of your Son, that you so love this sinful world, that you sent your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Father, may that everlasting life be known by each one of us as it was so dearly known and, and cherished by a brother in the Lord, Mr. Roger McMurrin. And may we seek to be faithful servants unto you, letting the light of the gospel shine forth in all that we do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.